Now time for oral questions. The Leader of the Massachusetts Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Finance. Um, minister, at uh, committee yesterday, we saw uh, former Premier McGuinty um, display the same disrespect for taxpayers oh, that we saw disrespect. from Premier Wynne at committee the other day. It seems uh, sad, Speaker, that the Order. Liberals treat truth like an inconvenience and accountability like a bother. Given the serious nature of the matters, Minister, before the Ontario Legislature, don't you think it's time that we allow Ontarians to have their say? Do they believe that your move to spend their tax money to cancel gas plans? Sorry for the interruption. Uh, I, I believe the member was finished. The leader was f just finished or not? No, no, thank you. No, no. <laughs> and I'll stop the clock for that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask people to come to order on this, and the shout-outs are not necessary, and I'll start to name, you, uh, uh, name your writing quickly. Leader. Finance Minister, given the serious nature of the matters before the Legislature and Committee surrounding the gas plant scandal, don't you think it's time that people had their say? To the vote in the Legislature, does this cross a line into corruption, or is it simply the cost of doing business? <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, what I know is this. This side of the House has been asked to report to the committee. This side of the House has taken leadership by being more open and transparent and by initiating initiatives to get to, the, to, to, to disclose as much as possible. And this side of the House has reported and delivered and appeared before this committee to disclose all that they know. Yet, Mr. Speaker, that side of the House doesn't show up. The, the Leader of the Opposition has been called and he hasn't appeared. For that matter, neither has any of the other candidates who fought and said that they too would not put the power plant in that spot. The, uh, the same goes this side. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, we all in this House agreed that the setting of those power plants were inappropriate. They all said Answer. that they would cancel it and or move it, as did we, and that's exactly what we've done. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, uh, Speaker, it is disappointing to see the same smug disregard uh, for taxpayers and the finance minister that we saw in evidence from Premier McGuinty and Premier Wynne. Similarly, the same degree of evasiveness, to put it, Kindly, Speaker. Let me um, ask, and hopefully I'll get a, a more serious answer from the Finance Minister. So Colin An Anderson appeared at the committee. He refuted the testimony of both Premiers Wynne and McGinty, and he said that everybody knew the cost was more than $40 million. Premier Wynne and Premier McGinty said they were not aware of that. So, Finance Minister, clearly somebody is not being honest with the people of Ontario, and it should be up to them to decide. So if Colin Anderson was not being honest, people, shouldn't he be fired? or if Premier Wynne was not being honest, isn't it time for her to go? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the only one being smug is the Leader of the Opposition, who does not appear before this House. We've asked for him to appear. We've said to him and to all others that we're willing to work together for the very purpose of getting to the truth and understanding what has taken place, understanding that they themselves also said that they would not build the power plant. They themselves took the steps by way of an election, no less, to say that they would cancel it, and they appeared before the communities with a bus and did a press conference. He even had a pink elephant right on the site saying, vote for me because I will be the one that will cancel the power plant. And he sent out robocalls, and he was on the telephone and doing town halls, standing up for the fact that we should not put a power plant in that place, and Mr. Speaker, that's what we've done. And he's sir? delivered on the very promise that he said he would do. Thank you. Final supplementary. <clears throat> you know, um, that's the kind of clownish answer from Finance Minister, which shows us why we have lost confidence of the ability of this government to get us out of the hole. <laughs> Let me ask you a, a question, uh, Finance Minister, that you. Um, Dodge the first time, hopefully you'll be more honest and direct this time. Um, we're tired of the Liberals blocking a confidence vote here in the Legislature. We're tired of the Liberals blocking the ability for members to stand up or sit down when it comes to deciding 
Does this gas plan scandal cross the line into corruption, or is any price worthy of being paid simply to save Liberal seats? Don't you think, Minister, we owe it to Ontarians to actually stand in our place and say this was right or this is wrong? Don't we owe it to Ontarians to actually stand in our Minister place and say North this goes order. across the line or is simply the way Question. this government is going to operate? Minister, will you call that confidence motion to the floor of the Legislature today? Thank you. Thank you. Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, the only circus that has been happening here has been the actions of the opposition. Because we have taken the steps necessary. The Premier wrote to the AG in regards to the Oakville. We all agreed that was a good thing. He immediately called the House back and struck some committees. We expanded the scope of the committees. We offered documents from across the government. The Premier appeared before the committee, and the committee has met since February, and they've heard from over 26 witnesses. More, furthermore, we've listened to the local communities. We recognize that we need to take proper steps going forward so that this doesn't happen anywhere else ever again. We need to make sure that we have the proper setbacks and the proper siting. So, Mr. Speaker, we will stay focused. And what we need to be focused when it comes to a confidence motion is the budget. Exactly. The budget is what matters to the people of Ontario. They're asking for us to continue moving forward, to continue stimulating economic growth, and continue to, to create jobs and the well-being of everyday Thank people you. in their everyday the member from Leeds Grenville. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Finance. Minister, it's time your Liberal government stops evading accountability. The ultimate accountability measure is a confidence vote right here in the Legislative Assembly, right on the floor. You know, uh, Speaker, it seems uh, to me if uh, if I was the finance minister, the first meeting I would have called, had I been you, was would to ask Colin Anderson of the Ontario Power Authority to give you a full costing of the cancellation of the Oakville and Mississauga plant as the incoming finance minister. When did you ask for a briefing from Colin Anderson of the OPA to get a full cost on the cancellations of Oakville and Mississauga? Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we immediately wrote to the Auditor General to examine the cost of the Oakville relocation. We immediately took the steps to identify all the costs that have taken place. The complexity and the changing of OBA estimates is understood now by all. So we have to make certain that we get it to, to, the, to, the, to the right numbers. I have taken the precautions necessary in putting something in our budget that accommodates the costs that we do know. And going forward, we'll ensure that the, 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 the contingencies and so forth are taken into consideration. But, Mr. Speaker, the opposition want to continue to deliberate over an issue that we are already resolving. What the people of Ontario want to know is, what are you going to do to help their lot in life on their everyday issues? What are you going to do to support this budget that speaks to the needs of the people of Ontario right now? We need to continue to create jobs. The member from Renfrew come to order. And uh, while we're at it, stop the clock. While we're at it, um, I've been hearing people use people's names again, and this time I will go to that individual if I continue to hear first names, second names, other than you must address people by their writing or by their title. And if it continues, I'll single that person out. Clear. Start the clerk. Finish. Ten second wrap up. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to reaffirm what's really important here, and that's to stimulate economic growth, ensure that we're creating the jobs necessary for the people of Ontario, and move forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, with, back to the minister. Well, with all due respect, Ontarians want to know when you asked for a full briefing from Colin Anderson of the OPA in your capacity as finance minister on one of the biggest, most expensive scandals the in the province history. Sir, you asked for the job. You campaigned for the job. Ontarians spent billions of dollars for you to keep your job. Sandra Popatello turned down the job so you could get it. Now you need to do your job. Will you tell us when you asked for a full briefing from Colin Anderson of the OPA, why aren't you doing your job? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, I I believe that I believe that haste. Thank you, Attorney General. 
have. You know, I believe that Hazel McCallion had it spot on. The much-revered mayor of Mississauga, when she came before the committee and she said, let the committee do its work, get on to something else, get on to the issues that the people of Ontario really and truly care about. We have been as open and as transparent as you possibly could be. The Premier appeared before the committee, which has never, to the best of my knowledge, happened before. The former Premier uh, appeared before the committee. All of these, all of these people are trying to be as open yes, and as sir. transparent to tell you exactly, to tell you exactly what they knew and when they do it. Let the committee do its work. Let the Auditor Thank General you. do its work. Thank He's you. done the work for me. Thank you. Final supplementary. I can't believe what I just heard. Uh, back to the Minister of Finance. Minister, the hard-working people of Ontario want the accountability resorted to this legislature, your Liberal government's unwillingness to call our want of confidence motion for debate shows the arrogance from which you have treated this entire scandal and your refusal to deal with the consequences. Today, I tabled a motion that we will be debated this week and will automatically cause a vote on the call to motion for the want of confidence. The NDP need to decide whether they're going to prop up this government, a government that they continue to criticize. We look forward to them voting in favour of the want of confidence motion. We believe Ontarians deserve a vote in this legislature to see if the Liberals have the confidence of the people, and it is imperative that all members get that Question. opportunity to vote on the want of confidence motion. Will you call that motion? You know, we've talked about timing before. You've got to be better at it because when everything gets quiet, you're heard. Thank you. Attorney General. The Premier appeared before the committee, which is unprecedented in the history of this legislature. The former Premier appeared. When is the Leader of the Opposition going to appear? When is he going to appear? When is he going to come up with his costing as to what it will take? The costing will be— Actually, this is a comment to both sides. Someone's answering, let them answer. Someone's asking, let them ask. And the shouting back and forth will be stopped quite quickly. Finish, please. So very simply, when is the Leader of the Opposition going to appear in front of the committee and tell them what he would have paid to cancel those plans? Because if he had formed government, and heaven forbid he didn't, he would have cancelled the plans as well. Let, let, let the Auditor General continue with the work on the Mississauga the plan. Well, that's, that's, that's decent. Now you don't even want to listen to the answer. The member for Oxford come to order. The member from Far Hill come to order. The member from York come to order. The member from Lincoln, the King College come to order. Second time, the member from Leeds Grenville come to order. I got a system and it'll work. Finish. Uh, speaker, it's very unfortunate that the members ask the question and, and they don't even want to listen to the answer. They want to shout down to the government in giving them an answer to the question they've asked. So my question is, when is the leader of the opposition going to come up with his cost of estimate Thank as you. to what it would cost to, to... Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Over the last few days, we've heard from thousands of Ontarians who say they want to see positive change in the budget, but they also need to know that the government is going to be investing their money transparently and accountably. We think that's a concern that we should all take seriously in this House. Does the Minister of Finance agree? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, of course we agree. It's why we've put in our budget a number of accountability measures. On pages 217 to 220, we talk about a number of initiatives that we put in place to support accountability. We also put it on pages 143 to 145. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, was this government that also introduced legislation around the Broader Public Sector Accountability Act in 2010, as well as the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act in 2004. We, as, as a government, took the steps necessary because of what has happened in the past to ensure that even pre-election reporting be reviewed by the Attorney General. We're always open 
to doing more transparency and more fiscal uh, oversight in the things that we do. Thank you. Well, Speaker, my initial thoughts are two words, gas plants. Yeah. That's how well their accountability works. Yeah. People are being told that they have to make sacrifices in tough times, Speaker, that there's not enough money to go around while we try to balance the books. They see hundreds of millions of dollars going to waste at Orange, at eHealth, at the gas plants, while their government claims that they have to make cuts at hospitals in order to invest in home care. Is the minister ready to admit that this is a problem and take some concrete steps to address it? Well, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's why we've taken a number of measures already. I mean, we're strengthening the post-secondary education accountability measures in our budget. We're taking steps to secure even more accountability around home care and community care. We've taken steps around the child welfare initiatives in our budget. There's a whole slew of opportunities that we recognize are important to take better measures, including, including transfer payment accountability, tax support accountability, and agency accountability. All issues that we recognize are important, that we know that we require greater oversight, and we will continue to work towards doing just that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, yesterday the Premier claimed that she had, quote, done everything in her power to be accountable. With respect, I don't think that's a good enough answer. Ontarians are frustrated with the government's failure to be accountable, and families deserve to have a government that's accountable to them. Today, I put forward a simple idea, a financial accountability office modeled on Ottawa's parliamentary budget, budget office. Is the government ready to start rebuilding trust with Ontarians, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, as mentioned, we've taken a number of initiatives, a number of steps to improve accountability. I believe that to be a very interesting idea. I do look forward to having this discussion, and I look forward to having a very productive Member conversation the PM, around the issue. Order. I think what's necessary here as well is that let's get this budget passed because there's a number of things at stake, a number of things that, this, that the opposition members recognize all too well need to be addressed and need to be passed in order to proceed. So, I would. Uh, like to cite those measures in the budget, recognize what's important here is the well-being of the people of Ontario, and I look forward to continuing to work with the opposition Thank members you. to do Your just question. that. Third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Minister of Finance. Ontarians want to see real positive, and change, uh, real positive change that improves their lives, but too often they've seen governments act in the interests of their own political party instead of the interests of the public. And instead of giving people the facts, their government gives them empty spin and misleading information. A financial accountability office would take a small step to providing some real accountability. Does the minister agree that more accountability is needed here? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I responded to that. We have already cited the fact that we're taking a number of measures in our budget to address greater accountability. We've taken the steps necessary to improve what we need to do going forward. We recognize that the idea put forward is a good idea. It's interesting. It's something that we see has happened by the federal government. Uh, what's at stake right now, though, Mr. Speaker, is increasing Ontario Child Benefit. What's at stake is the Ontario Trillium Benefit that the member from, from East Beaches East York has been advocating for. What's at stake is auto insurance that the member from Brampton has also been acting for. What's at stake is permanent gas tax funding for our municipalities. What's at stake is more roads and bridges funding for rural communities. What's at stake is an infrastructure modernization plan that will continue to support uh, the people of Ontario and greater competitiveness going forward. Mr. Speaker, what's at stake is for us to ensure that we're on plan to reduce our deficit yes, to sir. zero, and we need to do that for the benefit of creating more jobs and helping people in their everyday lives, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect, what's at stake is the trust of the people in their government. That's what's at stake. The Premier admitted that he didn't know and didn't much care what the cost would be of cancelling the private power deals in Mississauga and Oakville, and in her testimony, the current Premier made it clear that she didn't much care either. 
Ontarians deserve a lot better than that, Speaker. That's why New Democrats put guarantees in our suggestions for the budget, and it's why we clearly identified savings so that we could invest in prosperity that everyone can share in without making harmful cuts. And it's why we're calling for a financial accountability office that would let the public know how the government intends on spending their money. Surely the minister doesn't have a problem with accountability, Speaker. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we're taking steps necessary to improve and enhance our accountability. So uh, it's, that's not the issue. And the, the, the notion of being a caring and more compassionate uh, party, oh, that, that's, that we actually have a whole section in our budget around a fair society. We know we need to support those most vulnerable so that they get a better start and ability in life. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite should be looking towards them and finding ways to support this budget on that score. But as I said, it's an interesting idea. I welcome the opportunity to have that conversation. This is not about being partisan. This is about the people of Ontario. Let's look after them. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I fear that what I heard is that the minister seems to think that the status quo is good enough. But he seems to be the only one that thinks that, because people are telling me that they want to see a budget that is fair and transparent and accountable to them. And that's not what they see right now, Speaker. Will the minister tell Ontarians whether the status quo is good enough or whether he agrees that Ontarians deserve something much better? Thank you. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker. We've consulted with over 600,000 people in the preparation of this budget. For the member now to suggest that, well, we're going to consult after the budget's been prepared, after all the work that's been done, after the contributions and recommendations that have been made by all members of the House. Mr. Speaker, we've taken those initiatives, we've taken those steps, and we do agree we want to be more accountable, we want to be more transparent, we want to take those measures. We're implementing those in this budget. So it's interesting that the member now is trying to somehow express that they're the ones bringing this idea forward. Fine, take credit all you want. What, the, what really matters is the people of Ontario. We will work for them. We'll work with you. And so we'll work with the official opposition for that end because because what we want is to stimulate economic growth. Thank you. We have a very sensitive recovery. All the more reason we need stability. Thank you. New question. The member from Nicholson. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, we've always known that the Liberals will do and say anything to put their party's interests first. We saw more proof of that yesterday as the former Premier tried to explain away your gas plant scandal. First, you needed the power. Then you said you didn't need the power. The current Premier finally admitted it was a political decision, but the former Premier says he cancelled the gas plants for the kids. Too bad no one over there cared about those kids a few years earlier, Speaker. We could have saved at least $585 million. The members will come to order. Thank you. Please carry on. Thank you, Speaker. I'll ask the minister, tell us how much money you've set aside in your budget for your seat saver program. I don't know where that member was five, six years ago. I know where I was. And I know what I was doing to support and protect the communities. These power plants weren't even in my riding. But I was concerned about the well-being of the people of the communities that surround it. That is why I sat on the Clarkson Airshed Advisory Committee. That's why I stood with 12 to 15 different town halls to support the community. That is why I advocated to move those power plants from the very beginning. And I stood by and I asked for support of the members opposite. I stood by the uh, energy critic, no less. When he went to our community, those communities, he said, Nah, it's a done deal. Only after I came forward and fought for it, as I sat in the rump, I saw people support. So to the member opposite, we were there, I was there all along, fighting for the community and making certain that this sort of thing never happens again anywhere in the province Thank of you. Ontario. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I never heard a budget figure, so I... 
Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Budget uh, uh, figure speaker, so it's obvious the uh, minister has taken tap dancing lessons from the House Leader. There's more proof of how de uh, desperate your Liberals are to save their own hides and cling to power. They continue to ignore a centuries old parliamentary tradition in bringing our non confidence motion to the floor of this House. They continue to hope their orange life preservers to my left will sell themselves out and rescue them from the orange uh, sea of scandal. We table a motion today calling on this House to bring our original non-confidence motion to a vote. Minister, will you do the honourable thing, put democracy and the people ahead of the Liberal Party, and bring forward our non-confidence motion? Thank you. The Attorney General, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the member is a former mayor, and he knows very well that the real confidence motion and vote is under budget. That's what we're talking about here. This is a fair budget that's being presented to the people of Ontario. That'll be the confidence vote, and we'll see how you and the members of the NDP vote on it. But in the meantime, Speaker, I still come back to the point I made a little bit earlier. Why is the Leader of the Opposition not appearing before the committee with his numbers as to what it must cost to move those plans? We've got the Auditor General, who did a report on the Oakville plan situation. We've got him doing one now on the Mississauga uh, plan situation. The Auditor General is highly regarded. Why don't we let him do his work and why don't we get on with the rest of the work for the people of Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Minister, when the Premier was selected by the Liberal Party, she didn't even bother to ask the outgoing Premier how much it would cost to cancel the plants in Mississauga and Oakville in the scandal that eventually cost the member for Ottawa South his premiership. Being a leader means asking tough questions and it means giving tough answers, but neither the former premier nor the current premier did that. Doesn't, acting, doesn't the acting premier think that showing real government accountability to the people means that the premier should have at least asked her predecessor about the costs of cancelling the Oakville and Missis Mississauga gas plants. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has gone well beyond and she has taken full responsibility and she wants to increase her accountability and transparency on this measure. That's why she sought support from the other members of the House to do a committee that would allow for all of this to come out even more quickly. She's asked the right questions. She's now wrote to the AG in terms of getting all the, the costs that were involved with Oakville, and they agreed, and we anticipate it shortly. She's asked for immediate a call back to the House so that we can strike these committees. We've expanded the scope of the committees. We've offered documents from across the government. The Premier has appeared before the committee. The Premier uh, the past Premier has done the same. We've had our Ministers of Energy appearing before the committee. We have taken over 26 witnesses to this committee. We are Answer. doing our utmost to try to get to the issues and to resolve them, more importantly, in the future so that they never occur again. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, I asked the former Premier whether the current Premier ever asked how much the promise to cancel the Mississauga gas plant would cost when she was the campaign vice chair on the very campaign that made that promise. He said no. She never asked. I asked when the member for Don Valley West was a cabinet minister signing cabinet documents on Oakville. Did she ask the premier about costs then? He said no. She never asked. Ignoring these problems doesn't make them go away, and it doesn't show respect for the Ontarians who are paying the bills. Does the acting premier think that the way to show respect for families means denying the people real accountability for wasting their dollars? So, uh, unlike uh, the official leader of the opposition, the premier the Premier did appear before the committee. Exactly. The Premier did respond to these questions. We are doing what the committee wants us to do. More importantly, though, 
More importantly, the members should be asking, what are we going to do going forward? What are we going to do now to ensure that these sort of things never happen again? And what steps have we taken to do that? We're providing for siting restrictions. We're ensuring that community engagement is, is there. We want to make certain that greater accountability exists. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, in this budget, we talk about some of these initiatives, and this is where the member opposite should be working towards, supporting this budget so that we can get on with the business of helping the people of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Oakville. Speaker, I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The budget speaks to creating a prosperous and a fair Ontario. It's something I know that everybody across this province wants to see. We've heard a lot about the government's plan to increase jobs, tackle gridlock, reduce the price of auto insurance, and improve access to home care. But homelessness, Speaker, is still a problem that affects far too many people in Ontario and across Canada. All members of this House know that when people are given the opportunity to live in safe and affordable housing, our communities thrive. People are healthier mentally and physically, and their children do much better in school. So, Speaker, the question this morning to the Minister is, can you tell us what our government is doing to tackle the pressing issue of homelessness across the communities in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. There's nothing more distressing to me or our government than the knowledge that somewhere in Ontario that there's a child or a family or a senior wondering where they're going to sleep tonight. That's why our government re remains committed to a long-term affordable housing strategy, a first, the first of its kind actually in Ontario. Our investment in affordable housing is a partnership and in, in, with the federal government, and we are going. To, it's a $480 million investment to repair 7,000 affordable housing units in Ontario. And the program allows service managers to increase flexibility to let them develop local solutions to reduce wait times in communities across the province for people who need affordable housing. In the first year of the program, we helped 600 households, which are no longer in need of a roof over their head. Speaker, it is Answer. our government's goal to ensure those who need assistance when they're at their that most vulnerable get the help that they need. Yeah. It's good to hear the government takes homelessness seriously, as we all know the impacts of not doing that would be damaging. But this conversation is about investing in affordable housing. It's very similar to the debate we're having about transit in the GTHA. They both require infrastructure investments. They take a long time to construct, and they're very expensive to build. We know the politics of these types of investments aren't easy. Otherwise, other governments of other stripes would have come up with a long-term affordable housing strategy long ago. But at the end of the day, all levels of government have a stake in seeing a plan materialize. So in the minister's answer, Speaker, she, she spoke about our partnership with the federal government. What I want to know is what is this government going to do to continue dealing with homelessness, homelessness after the current $480 million commitment from the federal government Question. runs out. Thank you. Minister. Again, Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and we recognize the importance of affordable housing and continue to make this case to the federal government. And while our government welcomes the federal commitment to affordable housing, as they recently announced in their budget, the fact remains that the federal government is reducing its contribution to social housing oh, over the next no, 20 no, years shame, to shame. zero. Over the next 20 years exactly. to zero. So that's why, along with other provinces and territories, we're going to be meeting our federal counterparts this June. I hope that, that we can work uh, together to encourage our federal counterparts to, to live up to their shared obligation. In fact, their moral imperative on affordable housing. I, I, uh, I want to urge every member in this House, in this chamber, to join with our government to get them back at the table. Because this need for social housing is not a municipal Sir. issue, it's not a provincial issue, it's a societal issue. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, a member from Dufferin Calvin. My, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I deeply regret that I want, must once again ask the same question of you that we've been asking in committee and in this chamber on behalf of the people of Ontario. Yep. Both your current and former Premier have stuck to their talking points about regretting the decision to cancel the Mississauga and Oakville power plants at the cost of at least $585 million. At the recent retirement of Ontario's Auditor General, Jim McCarter said, governments work best when they're watched. 
Minister, you're being watched. Please use the opportunity to explain to the Ontario taxpayers how it is that a decision that had such serious financial implications would not be fully costed out before any cabinet decision was made. Attorney General. Attorney General. You know, the opposition can't have it both ways, Speaker. They wanted, the, they wanted the power plants cancelled. All of your candidates said that. Your own leader said that. The third party wanted to get the power, the power plants cancelled. We did exactly what every party and every, everybody wanted done. The people of Oakville and the people of Mississauga did not want those plants there. It's as simple as that. Why don't we just let the Auditor General do its work? He is an independent officer of this legislature. He did a report on the Oakville situation. He'll do a report on the Mississauga situation. And the people of Ontario will make up their own minds about that. That's what this is really all about. Let's leave it to the committee. Let's leave it to the Auditor General. Let's talk about the real issues that are facing the people of Ontario today. You signed this contract. You ripped up this contract. You need to take responsibility for this mess. At what point in this charade, this embarrassing charade, do you actually acknowledge your mistake, admit that you were wrong to cancel gas plants before you knew how much it was going to cost the people of Ontario? As the Finance Minister, surely you understand how that makes the Liberals look so willing to waste millions of dollars while other people pay. You could turn the page on this mess right now. You could actually do the right thing today and allow this assembly to debate the minister, the member from Simcoe Gray's non-confidence motion. Will you do it? The member from Halton come to order. <laughs> Attorney General. Well, Speaker, you know what this is all about as far as the opposition is concerned. It's, it's about game. political posturing. Political. That's all you're doing is political posturing. Let the Auditor General do its work with respect to Oakville. Let him do his work with respect to Mississauga. We have been as open and transparent as we possibly could be. The Premier has appeared before the committee. The former Premier has appeared before the committee. And no matter what's done, no matter what, what further we'll do in this regard, you will not be supportive. You know what? You wanted to pan the plans cancelled. They were cancelled. It's better for the people of Mississauga. It's better for the people of Oakville. And it's better for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today, the CEO of the Windsor Regional Hospital is raising concerns about the financial donations that were revealed in the newly re released contract between MedBuy and Marchese for chemotherapy drugs. He asked some pretty uh, straightforward questions. Why is a $20,000 contribution part of a bidding process. Uh -oh. Can the Acting Premier answer this question? Uh -oh. Acting Premier. Uh -oh. I can say this, Mr. Speaker. The issue of the chemo drug di dilution, the whole everything that's been uh, that has occurred is distressing for all of us. We all have members of our family or friends who have been affected. This has been drastic. We've taken immediate steps to try to bring resolution to it. We need to do what's best for the safety, the security of the very individuals and the patients that are affected. It affects all of us, and I am uh, been, been greatly disturbed by what has taken place. But I can say that we've taken steps, we've taken action. We've posted new regulations with all the hospitals to ensure that purchase of drugs are only from accredited and licensed uh, suppliers. Health Canada, of course, has a role here, a very big role in terms of oversight to post and to make amendments. The College of Pharmacists has posted their regulation and bylaw amendments. Uh, we're working with organizations who have a shared responsibility on this issue. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we've asked Jake to take over.
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is what's the province's role? Uh, with the release of these documents, hospital CEOs and patients are left with difficult questions about the bidding process. To many, it looks like nothing but a kickback. And throughout this entire fiasco, we've seen the government that is checked out of their oversight role, and the consequences have been immense for the people in this province. Will the acting premier clarify the purpose of this contribution and whether what many see as a kickback has any place in the transparent procurement process? Good question. Good question. Acting premier. Mr. Speaker. We're the government that took steps to try to support the industry. That's why we've, we've been dealing with uh, uh, generic drugs, for example, finding ways to uh, afford and, and provide better value for our taxpayers. But this is more important than that, Mr. Speaker. This is more important. This is about the safety and the security of our people, the patients that are affected, and to ensure that this doesn't ever happen again. It is why, Mr. Speaker, we have appointed a third-party reviewer, Dr. Jay Thiessen, to provide recommendations on how we can prevent this from ever happening again. We've asked all Ontario hospitals to ensure the appropriate quality assurance measures are put in place, and we will follow up with those hospitals and with the industry, and we'll continue to work with the federal government to ensure that they put the actions necessary to stop it from happening. So, Mr. Speaker, we believe what's necessary is to protect the people and the patients of Ontario. Thank you. Good question. A member from Niagara Falls. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, through you is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, Speaker, our government uh, recently tabled a, a great 2013 uh, budget. Uh, this budget is about creating jobs about helping people in their everyday lives. Bravo. Our government has presented a strong plan to help people across this province, creating jobs, connecting communities, and giving everyone a chance to succeed. A question that I am asked constantly from constituents in my riding of Niagara Falls, Niagara Lake, and Fort Erie, what is the government's planning to do to improve and modernize our infrastructure? Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, can the minister please inform this House about the investments our government is proposing in the budget to help communities across Ontario Question. address their vital infrastructure needs? Thank you. Yeah. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. I want to thank the uh, member for Niagara Falls for his question and for his advocacy on this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the finance minister has uh, built on what has been an unprecedented commitment to infrastructure in Ontario. Years past, typically, we would spend three or four billion dollars on infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we spent about 13 billion this past year and have committed to 35 billion dollars over the next three years. This is about a 400 percent increase after 40 years of neglect, Mr. Speaker. We're also continuing not just to fund infrastructure, but to focus, Mr. Speaker, on rural and northern communities. And particularly, we funded strategic asset management plans so every community in Ontario has a good sense of the condition of its infrastructure, can help set priorities, and can help work with the government to fund not just projects, Mr. Speaker, but coherent plans, Mr. Speaker. We have a strong focus in the north on, on highways and rural communities, on bridge and sir. smaller communities, Mr. Speaker. And I have a feeling the Minister of Rural Affairs may like to weigh in on this as well. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my follow-up question is back to the minister. I'm glad to hear the Ontario 2013 budget includes a focus on investing on growing infrastructure needs across the province. Uh, speaker, in order to keep our economy moving forward and on the right track, we need to ensure we make the right investments to build infrastructure today. Speaker, this includes the rural and the northern communities. Like in my riding of Niagara Falls and Niagara Lake and Fort Erie, Many communities across Ontario face unique challenges when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister please provide an update on the House and to the people of Ontario what our budget is proposing, particularly for the rural Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Minister of Rural Affairs. Speaker. The Minister of Rural Affairs. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that uh, this budget delivers for rural Ontario. We know that our rural communities face unique challenges and have important infrastructure needs. That's why the Ontario's 2013 budget proposes a new $100 million infrastructure fund for 
This fund will help small, rural, and northern municipalities build roads, bridges, and other critical infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind you that in 1997-98, 43% of all the roads and bridges were downloaded in East Ontario. We're catching up with that inventory. And Mr. Speaker, I have a great quote from uh, Bill Verbosch, the mayor of the municipality of East Ferris, in the riding of Dipensing. The $100 million being dedicated to rural northern is exactly what we've been looking for for years in the province of Ontario, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Uh, new question. A member from Halliburton, Portal Lake Park. My question is for the acting premier. Minister, you, the premier, and your cabinet colleagues have been governing this province with the help of smoke and mirrors to try and deflect the truth and responsibility for the ongoing gas plant scandal. We have examined countless documents and heard hours of testimony that clearly demonstrate the web of denials and half-truths which have been spun by this government. Yep. The total disregard for the taxpayers of Ontario and the continuing attempt to conceal the entire truth is a vivid reminder to all Ontarians that your government. I, um, I, I'm a little concerned about the weaving in and out of very, very close to being unparliamentary language, and I'm going to warn the member not to go down that road. Thank you. Carry on. Their, their actions are a reminder to all Ontarians that the Liberal government has lost the moral right to govern. So will the government do the honourable thing, allow Question. the non-confidence motion tabled by the member from Simcoe Gurry to come to the floor for a vote? Attorney General, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, Speaker, well, uh, Speaker. Let me, let me just say what the esteemed leader of the third party said about your non-confidence motion in a recent interview to CTV. She says, Andrea Horvath says, I think it's more about grabbing headlines well, and getting attention than it's a serious motion. From my about. perspective, let's deal with the real issues. That's and she right. is totally, totally correct. Budget. Let's see what the uh, member from Temiskaming James Bay said. Mr. Biso, he said, absolutely, again, about the Tory non-conference motion. Right. Absolutely not, because this is it's a game that they're playing. This is an it's attempt on the part of the Tories to do what they normally do, which is to find a weird way to try and get a headline that doesn't get you anything in the end. And he is totally right, too. Let's get down and talk about the real issues that are going to face the people of Ontario, and let the Auditor General do the member from Barrie will come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, well, this is a real issue. This is the biggest scandal in the province of Ontario. Yeah. 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 Almost a billion dollars of their money. You have lost the moral authority to govern, so I ask the Minister, the Premier has repeatedly said the budget will be the confidence motion. So since the NDP have demonstrated once again that their support is always for sale and that integrity is no longer a matter of principle, I ask again if the government will agree to a real vote of confidence and allow our non-confidence motion to come to the House of Commons. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Thank you. Attorney General. Great bit of acting there, I'll tell you that much. I'll tell you that much. Speaker, you want to hear about a real scandal that happened just before the 99 election? Want to hear about a real scandal? It's when your government at the time, it's when your government. The, the member's timing is pretty good again, so I'm going to ask the member from Renfrew to come to order. 
That'll be the last time I do it. Well, the people are, are still suffering the results of the Harris years. The from the team you, know, you want to hear about a real scandal? It's when your government in 1999 sold the 407 for three billion dollars. The Attorney General. The member uh, from Barrie come to order, the member the Minister of Rural Affairs come to order, and the member from Simcoe Gray will withdraw. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and the member from Huron Bruce, if it continues, you'll be warned. <laughs> Attorney General. Speaker, let the Auditor General do its work. Order. The member from Leonard. Kent Middlesex will go to his seat to withdraw. Well, he's the, new hot shot the member of the, the Minister of the Environment will come to order last time. <laughs> the, member from, the member from Thornhill will come to order. The member will withdraw. I'll withdraw cover up, Speaker. Oh. Uh, you will, uh, I, well, we haven't heard what said. I have a tremendous number of. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. It is clicking. I have a tremendous number of armchair quarterbacks that seem to want to do this. Just let me know. <laughs> the member will withdraw with no comment. I'll withdraw. Thank you. New question. The member from Kenora Rainy River. Speaker, on April 24th, the Premier and the Ministers of the Environment, Mr. Natural Resources, oh, to uh, to the Acting Premier. On April 24th, the Premier and the Ministers of the Environment, Natural Resources and Intergovernmental Affairs announced with much bravado that they had stepped forward to allegedly save the renowned Experimental Lakes Research Station in northwestern Ontario. Why, two weeks later, are scientists still barred from accessing the research station, putting the survival of important environmental research projects at risk? Another Liberal promise. Minister, uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Speaker. Of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. And as the member uh, said, uh, yes, we were very proud to have our Premier stand to acknowledge the importance of scientific research that takes place at the Experimental Lakes. And since that time, Ontario has been working collaboratively with the federal government, with the province of Manitoba, and with the International Institute for Sustainable Development and other partners to keep the ELA operational in the 2013 year and to ensure the sustained longer term uh, operations. I can tell you that the the federal government currently controls the site and access to it. Ontario is working to provide operating support. We're working towards an agreement with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and we want to ensure all members of this House and all uh, researchers and others across Ontario that we understand the urgency of this, and this is a very active and ongoing Thank file. you. Supplementary. Speaker, the government website still claims that the Ontario government will, quote, keep the Experimental Lakes area operational in 2013, end quote, and that it will ensure important science conducted in the ELA can continue. But today we read in the Globe and Mail that nothing has been solved. Scientists are being prevented from accessing the research station. Long-standing projects are being jeopardized. Instead of holding premature press conferences, when will this government actually do something to ensure that the Experimental Lakes research area remains open. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I can tell the, the, the member that uh, what the Premier said was to indicate that Ontario is prepared to step up to ensure that the experimental lakes continue. And as, as I said in the previous answer, and I suspect that if she reads the transcripts, she will see that we are working with the federal government, who controls access to the site at this point in time. We're working with the province of Manitoba, and we are working with IASD to ensure both a short term and a long-term plan for experimental lakes. We understand fully, uh, and we have been working to ensure that all parties, including the federal government, understand the scientists' concerns and our government's desire for the research to continue as planned this year and into the future, Speaker. We're actively engaged in this file, and I think Answer. all Ontarians should be proud of the fact that our government has stepped up to protect the experimental Thank lakes. Thank you. New question. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. The Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, 
On a too frequent basis, I've got workers coming up to me in my riding of Eglin Lawrence, and these are people that make ten, eleven dollars an hour. They work as cleaners. They work at night. They love being here in Canada. They love the job, but they constantly complain about being pushed too hard by their employers. They get always intimidated, threatened with uh, losing their job if they don't work hard. And they're asking me, what can you do as the MPP? Can you ask our Ministry of Labour if they could do more to stop this sort of very silent war that goes on in some part of uh, Ontario and Toronto where, you know, the trouble... Member from Timmins, James Bay, come to order. Well, here's the member of the NDP. And question. Not allowing me to ask a question about question. these workers. These workers are union workers, and some are non-union workers. These workers are saying the government Thank should be doing more. Thank you. Asking the minister. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I, I, I want to assure the member of Eglinton, Eglinton Norris that his constituents can rest assured that the Ministry of Labour is out there in workplaces across the province, ensuring that workers know their rights and that employers are living up to their responsibilities. In fact, we have modernized our system, Speaker, to conduct more proactive work uh, to better serve those that need our help. And, Speaker, in fact, in the 2013 budget, if that is passed, uh, starting in 2013 and 14, the government will invest additional $3 million per year to hire more officers to provide proactive inspections at workplaces. This will bring the government's total investment to $7.5 million since 2009 yes, in proactive employment inspection. Our proposed funding speaker will increase enforcement, which in turn will help to ensure workers in all sectors Thank are protected you. and treated fairly in all workplaces. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, just uh, I have told your staff just the other day, Minister, I've got these night from Durham, caretakers and cleaners. They work downtown with all the high-rise towers where all these guys and uh, some women are making big bucks, yet the cleaners, they're getting pushed around, asked to clean 40 washrooms in a couple of hours, and then the manager comes along, and this is a union shop. Then the manager comes along and says, oh, uh, you're not cleaning fast enough. And if, you, and if you don't clean fast enough, you're gone. And the poor guy is only making $10.25 an hour to start. Will these officers we're employing go into the downtown high-rise towers and talk to some of these people who own these buildings and Jim. these fancy companies and say, you've got to treat your workers fairly. You just can't make money. Treat your workers you. fairly. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And a very important question. The Ministry of Labour is committed to increasing compliance with the Employment Standards Act through education, outreach, and proactive inspections. The Ministry, Speaker, now has a total of 30 officers in the previous year, an increase of 50 per cent from the previous year. And if the budget is passed, Speaker, we will add 20 more officers to a dedicated enforcement team. Yeah, yeah. These officers will conduct an additional 1,400 proactive inspections each year across the province. This is more than three times the number of inspections conducted annually since 2010, Speaker. Proactive inspections help educate and encourage compliance so that workers in all sectors are protected and treated fairly in workplace. This yes, is a powerful and often called for change to how we will work with businesses, especially small businesses and their workers. Thank and you. I hope all members will support the budget to make it happen. Thank you. New question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Finance this morning which only seems fair given we now know that the price to keep him in that seat is $300 million. Oh, okay. It's fair that he would stand up and ask some, answer some questions here today. This government, Minister, is plagued by negligence in a way that is simply unacceptable. According to the OPA, everybody over there knew around the Cabinet table that it was going to cost more 
to cancel those power plants and what the government originally said. A week after the current Premier's shameful display of selective memory in front of the Justice Committee, yesterday the former Premier went before the Justice Committee and again embarrassed that office that he sat in for nine years. The people of Ontario in this House have no confidence in this Premier, None. the old one, or this current cabinet, or this current government. Why won't you call yes, our confidence motion for debate, put an end to this scam that's perpetrating hundreds of millions of dollars against the taxpayers of Ontario? You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister of Finance. I guess the, the rebut is this, Mr. Speaker. Why won't your leader appear before the committee? Why won't you appear before them and answer questions as well, Mr. Speaker? We paid $300 million for that seat, and I can tell you right now, we overpaid for that seat. The people of Ontario paid $300 million for you to stand there like a fool and not answer questions and kick the questions to your grandma. The member will withdraw. Which one, sir? I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw. It just it's sickening for the people of Ontario to watch you you know laugh off 600 million dollars you're laughing off 600 million dollars wasted you don't have the confidence of this house you don't have the confidence of Ontarians we have absolutely no confidence in you to do that job especially at the price that we've paid for it call the one of confidence you. motion to the floor thank you Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have a very serious matter before us indeed. And that's this budget, Mr. Speaker. This is the confidence motion that the people of Ontario are expecting us to talk about. Deal with that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question. The member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. According to Waterfront Toronto, the province's half billion dollar investment in the waterfront has paid off. Since 2001, Waterfront Toronto has generated $240 million in revenue for the province and attracted development projects worth $2.6 billion. This success is threatened by plans to expand Billy Bishop Airport to allow jet planes, which Waterfront Toronto CEO warned could bring traffic congestion, noise, impacts to public space, and disruption to boating and maritime activity. Why is the minister shrugging off airport expansion as a federal matter rather than defending the province's interests along Toronto waterfront? Thank you, Transportation. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're not shrugging anything off. I, I think on a number of issues, those of us on this side of the House uh, may differ with uh, the members opposite. We actually respect the Constitution of Canada, Mr. Speaker, and airports are not regulated by the province of Ontario or any provincial government. The zoning matters, Mr. Speaker, relating to the airport and the permissions and agreements are signed between the City of Toronto and the, uh, and the uh, Port Authority and the airport and the federal government. We are the only government that isn't a signatory to it, nor do we have a say in it, Mr. Speaker. The party opposite often raises the issues about when governments interfere in other jurisdictions. They and their cousins, in, where, where they're in government, are very defensive about protecting that. Mr. Speaker, as there are many members of his party on the Toronto City Council, I have a lot of confidence in my city councillors to manage this issue well and to respect the jurisdictional authority of the federal government, Mr. Speaker, in this matter, who do regulate this and who are responsible for it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. See the police. Supplementary. Speaker, the, uh, the public wants a sustainable and vibrant waterfront, and the public has been clear that this does not include mega malls and Ferris wheels, mega casinos, and it does not include a mega air airport either. I recognize there are many who enjoy the convenience of a small-scale airline, but opening up the airport to jets and long-haul flights threatens the livability and vibrancy of Toronto's waterfront. And each time the waterfront has been threatened, the public has stood up to defend the public interest. 
Will the minister stand with the public and defend the public's interest on the waterfront? Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, I will meet with Waterfront Toronto. I do on a regular basis. I will review the matters and recommendations of Waterfront Toronto. I also listen to my constituents, Mr. Speaker, uh, who live in the downtown area, being the member for that area. Mr. Speaker, we understand the role of the federal government and the City of Toronto. Right now, the City Council is actively considering this file. Maybe the member opposite does not have confidence in the City Council of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. We work very well with them and we have respect for them. And I have confidence in Councillor Wong Tam and Councillor McConnell, who's a member of his party, who are well managing this issue. And not one City Councillor has called me and said, Would the provincial government weigh in, Mr. Speaker? Not a single request. And I meet with my City Councillors, Mr. Speaker, on a regular basis. But given his party is the official opposition, maybe they'll have better success with this issue than they have with the Thank Environmental you. Lakes where we did have to step in when the federal opposition Thank you. Thank you. Point of order from the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During questioning by our member from Halliburton Cortha Lakes Brock, the Minister for Training Colleges and Universities suggested that she should ask a nursing question because she's a nurse. I hope he would apologize for that comment because nurses can hold this government. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me rule on this one. Uh, that's not a point of order. Any member has an opportunity to correct their own record, as I've asked before. And even while I'm in the middle of a sentence, the member continues. The member from Training College and Universities. I think, Mr. Speaker, the member ought to get his hearing checked because I said no such thing. No. The. Uh, I, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to sit down. That's not a point of order. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.